Today we are at Saraburi province in Thailand. Uh, the owner of this place has converted her land uh, from growing lemongrass and some other Thai traditional fruits into gratom. 18 months ago after Thailand has uh, legalized the gratom, they, uh, they seized opportunity. So they decided to grow the gratom here next to the water in her land. This place, they are careful on no use of pesticide, they never use chemical, and they protect their water to be as clean as possible for the safety of the gratom products. Renault planted thousands of trees on her land hoping to capitalize on a global boom in demand for kratom. On the other side of the world, in the United States, many consumers of kratom-based products praise it for helping them deal with pain and other ailments. In dealing with chronic pain and doing pain management, taking high-powered opioids for many years, being that's all that I knew for the pain, it was okay. But then I discovered kratom and I got even better pain relief. It was amazing to me and that's why i become an advocate making sure that other people know that there's a plant out there that could possibly help more than traditional opioids that can be dangerous yet there's another side to the story in a texas town south of dallas the family of dustin hernandez is mourning his death which was blamed on an overdose of metrogenine one of the active ingredients in kratom my family suing the kratom industry to try to get some control over it to keep from killing people. They're selling stuff as all natural and safe and they're being sneaky about it because they know that it's not and uh, it's very harmful and it can lead to death. That in a nutshell is the yin and yang of kratom. The plant shows the potential to improve health and it puts money in the pockets of farmers in Southeast Asia. But for some in the United States, Kratom means nothing but trouble. In recent years, products derived from the leaves of the Kratom tree have become a staple in smoke and CBD shops and online stores, herbal medicine outlets, and even in gas stations. I think with Kratom, uh, we have to look at it as uh, uh, a twofold uh, paradigm. One is the traditional modes of consumption, which is how they use it in uh, Southeast Asia, the uh, plant leaves by boiling or chewing, as opposed to how it's consumed here in North America, where we have highly concentrated products, products that may contain other contaminants, consumption by individuals who may be on multiple medications or have other medical conditions. There are different types of kratom products. In Southeast Asia, people chew fresh leaves or consume drinks made by boiling fresh leaves in water. People in the United States make drinks from dried kratom powder or crushed leaves. In the US, kratom extracts may increase the potency of active compounds and health risks. Some kratom-labeled products in the U.S. contain other psychoactive substances. Americans take kratom-labeled products for a variety of reasons, as a mild pick-me-up, like coffee or tea, to address chronic pain, and to withdraw from addiction to opioids and other substances. Those last two uses intrigue medical scientists. Humans have been using opioids as remedies for thousands of years, and now, with the rapid spread of addiction to opioids, it has become a full-blown love-hate relationship. We need opioids to manage pain during surgery and in its aftermath and in the final stages of life. This family of drugs is essential to modern life, yet opioids are also a torment to individuals and families and are entangled with some of our most pressing social problems. I think there are still many uh, mysteries around Kratom. Research in substance use disorder over 30, 50 years maybe, uh, there hasn't been much progress. And if you look at the problem of substance use disorder, it's, it's enormous, it's huge. So ultimately we want to find uh, or discover a medication that would help people who have substance use disorder. Opioids are natural products. They're isolated from the opium poppy. 
all disease and all problems are, are really coming from nature in the beginning. And we should have a balance in nature and we should have a solution to those problems somewhere out there. And so I feel very strongly that Kratom could be one of the pieces of that puzzle in terms of helping solve the opioid crisis. Kratom has a great potential because in the past, it has been used in traditional medicine for mild illnesses such as muscle pain, muscle fatigue, and diarrhea. Now I can see its great potential in obesity, diabetes, depression, and pain. Could Kratom be a solution? Can we reap the potential benefits of Kratom without the health risks that come with Kratom-labeled products sold in the United States today? The short answer is maybe. So much about Kratom is still unknown or little understood, and so much misinformation is being spread that there are no quick or easy answers. Almost everything is unknown <laughs> about Kratom. There's very low solid <laughs> evidence. It's, it has not been comprehensively uh, focusing on, on multiple aspects of, of Kratom cultivation or Kratom use and and all potential aspects of, of pharmacology of all uh, active ingredients in Kratom. This film is the story of the quest to solve the mysteries of Kratom. The kratom tree is native to Southeast Asia and is grown primarily on plantations. Many of the native trees have been chopped down, but when left alone, the trees can grow to be 40 to 50 feet tall. Most of the kratom-based products sold in the United States use leaves grown in Indonesia, where there is little regulation governing growing, using, and exporting the leaves. Saya memiliki kebun itu uh... Ada kebun dan memiliki beberapa pegawai. E, untuk proses pemeliharaan itu sangat mudah. Prosesnya cuma e, butuh air bersih dan e, perawatan seperti pupuk. Setelah proses panen tadi tersebut e, dipetik, daunnya ya kita jemur. Setelah proses remahan, selang langkah selanjutnya ya kita harus menggilingnya menjadi tepung. Nah. Kratom yang setelah kami jual, nah biasanya itu setelah kami packing, kami ekspor, apalagi untuk ekonomi daerah terpencil seperti di Kalimantan Barat, terutama di Kapuas Hulu, itu kratom sangat menunjang untuk ekonomi bagi petani. Karena di sisi eh, mereka dulu sebenarnya sebagai petani karet, merubahnya menjadi petani kratom, Karena penjualan kratom itu sangat mudah. Thailand legalized kratom for traditional medicine in 2022, but didn't immediately allow companies to sell health remedy products at higher dosages. As of early 2024, exporting was illegal. That put a squeeze on farmers and on prices. Man. ปริมาณเยอะขึ้นตลาดมันมันยังไม่กว้างคือไปเมืองนอกไม่ได้ก็คือใช้ในประเทศเนี่ยตอนนี้มันมันค่อนข้างจะเหลือเหลือเพื่
In rural Southeast Asia, there's a long tradition of people chewing kratom leaves or boiling them to make drinks. The leaf is said to help people tolerate hard work in the hot sun, or to treat pain, and for everything from improving one's sex life to managing diabetes. Since legalization in Thailand, stands selling kratom-based drinks are popping up all over the place. Cooks add fresh kratom leaves to water in large cauldrons and boil them for two and a half hours. Then they pour the liquid through a filter and chill it rapidly. In a couple of hours, the kratom decoction is ready to drink. In its pure state, kratom juice tastes like a bitter tea. Some kratom sellers sweeten it by adding soda pop or sugar. How? Kratom decoction cooked in Thailand or Malaysia looks like. It's a milky, non-transparent substance. Tha Warren Miadklom chews four or five kratom leaves per day to help him deal with the heat. He says withdrawal symptoms are minor when he stops using it. But other farm workers say they have painful symptoms when they stop, though they are short-lived. For people with severe dependence on kratom, they want to use it all the time. So it's like a chain smoking. And if they stop using it, they have very strong craving symptoms and bone pain, a lot of withdrawal symptoms. That, that is quite severe. Much of the research in Southeast Asia focuses on Kratom's traditional uses. It is typically consumed when fresh there, while Kratom-based products in the U.S. are dried, processed, and shipped thousands of miles, which may lead to degradation and even toxicity. At University Science Malaysia, Researchers are investigating kratom as it exists in that country, where it is illegal to sell or consume. They hope to foster the development of new botanical drugs to address pain and treat diabetes and substance use disorders. Our long, mid-term and long-term plan is basically to develop kratom into a pharmaceutical product, okay? uh, not to be used as an OTC, uh, but to be used uh, with prescription, just like you know the opioids. Okay, so it could be it could be one of the uh, option for those uh, undergoing methadone replacement therapy. The kratom research program began to take shape after researchers saw that people were using kratom to deal with withdrawal from opioids. They started with surveys of kratom consumers to see what was going on, then launched studies of the impact of kratom on mice and rats. Their studies paint a vastly different picture of kratom use in Malaysia compared to the United States. A lot of people are having negative thoughts, negative perceptions. Uh, you know, kratom was turned into a huge controversy. But when I went out on my field trips, I discovered that what was being claimed was the opposite than what was being reported to me by people who have been using kratom. I've not seen nor have I heard of any fatal overdose of kratom in Malaysia. Uh, Non-fatal, there could be possibilities of it, but again, there's no documented evidence. In our region, the Southeast region, we don't find any, any big issue with kratom because the, we can get the plant fresh leaves here and people use fresh leaves to prepare kratom decoction. Some say that it may have some addiction property at uh, higher dose. As to my knowledge, uh, if it's given in a proper dose, I don't think so it can be addictive. 
Marek Havarski of Yale has been collaborating with the group at University Science Malaysia for more than a decade. We have conducted a series of, of laboratory studies, of ethnographic investigations. Uh, we are doing a lot of analytical work trying to understand uh, chemical composition of, of kratom, kratom leaves. We conducted one randomized uh, clinical trial with humans. They ran the study using humans to see if kratom lessens pain. They recruited 26 volunteers who were kratom users. Each participant got three drinks. Some people got kratom and the placebo, others got just the placebo. After drinking, participants plunged a hand into ice water, held it there, and removed it when they could not stand the pain any longer. A statistician analyzed results. Participants who drank kratom were on average twice as tolerant of pain as others. Our preliminary uh, study gives us a very, uh, an early signal of how useful or whether potentially it can be useful for pain. Meanwhile, colleagues at USM are experimenting with rats to explore using whole leaf kratom to help people avoid the pain and discomfort of withdrawal from other substances. So now I'm working like three kind of the model. One is on methamphetamine, which is a psychostimulant and morphine. And also now it's on alcohol to see whether kratom can be used as a replacement therapy for this, this three model. Another major thrust for the group is raising kratom trees under controlled conditions so they can produce leaves with consistent quality and potency. That means establishing their own kratom plantation. We are starting a line of botanical research trying to understand the botany and biology of that tree. To get the plantation going, they're gathering samples of superior plants from illegal kratom plantations in northern Malaysia. In our field work today, we, in, we, we visited farmers and they told us kratom trees are, are very, very resilient. They can be harvested over and over for a very long period of time. We've seen trees that are completely naked, so to speak. They're, every single leaf is, is picked and that tree springs to life fairly, fairly soon and, and they continue producing. This is the first first ever that anybody attempts to to bring back kratom to to nature, so to speak. I don't know. There's so many important points, you know. The researchers are also using seeds to propagate trees. They're investigating to identify the optimal stage of seed development in which to harvest the seeds for planting. At Prince of Songla University in Thailand, scientists are exploring a wide range of kratom-related topics, from botany to neuroscience. The most important what I discover is the distribution of kratom around country in Thailand there are contain different amount of the metragenine and some other type of the compounds. Metragenine is one of the most important active ingredients found in kratom. Uh, the high and the low uh, depends on the seasonal and geographical origin. With the chemical profile, they are not similar in every aspect. So we have to quantify of the chemicals in each sample. We use a whole extract of kratom. We don't use the purified component because 
we just we really want to represent the the plants because the local people use leaf. Gratum extract show antidepressant like effect in animal and we can use Gratum to treat like drug withdrawal and it also have a reduced body weight in animal. Because it's very really sensitive to uh, perform experiment in human in terms of ethics. That's why we use non-invasive technique to record the brain wave or EEG in volunteer who consume Gratum. From our pre preliminary research, we don't have, we don't found any difference between the pe people who regularly use Gratum for longer than 40 years compared to the normal people. We don't have any defect in their heart or brain signal. We found like the people who use Gratum for longer time have lower level of cholesterol. Sakan Warren Homhoon of nearby Wailalak University is studying the medicinal effects of traditional folk remedies that include Kratom. Um, in the southern of Thailand, the, the Thai traditional doctor, we have a lot of um, traditional herbal medicines. We have a lot of um, formulation, but um, the one the, on the major problem is about um, we don't have the lack of the scientific. So I found that um, um, Gratom has the therapeutic effect, especially in the metabolic disease. But the one major problem and we try to foul is the concentration or the doses. In Bangkok, Dr. CBD, a seller of over-the-counter herbal remedies, is developing Kratom-based remedies, well-being products, and energy drinks. The mission and the vision of the company clearly was, you know, to create these standardized products um, to be distributed um, globally. So we do work on the active lifestyle people, people who want to exercise, have active lifestyle, um, they want their energy, they want uh, their stamina. You also have um, products for people with health care pain points. So that would help people with, you know, diabetes, um, blood sugar level, um, uh, people with pain. Um, and also, um, we're working on the um, formulation for opioid addictions. Um, but we don't just work on um, Gratom or Mitragynine alone. We do have um, pharmacological formulations to, to use different types of herbs, different types of extract to help deliver the best efficacy for the, those pain points. Horn Chai is working with farmers and food processors to assure steady supplies of quality Kratom. Right now we have supported from Thai FDA to bring Gratom into dietary supplement, into the raw material, and it is our big challenge to export Gratom to, to other countries, especially in USA. The important thing that we have been focusing on is to combine the uh, strength of Western medicine and Eastern medicine together. We use natural substance, um, to help people, to heal people. Um, but we have to do it with Western standard so that you know, things do have um, quality control. Safety and non-toxicity must come first. Um, and lastly, the efficacy needs to be there. Um, about 16, 17 years ago, when my son was um, uh, two years old, uh, he was diagnosed with Asperger, which is you know certain type of autism. We did try the, um, uh, the Western medicine, uh, didn't do him any good. So we started healthy products, um, gluten-free, dairy-free, casein-free. We began the, the journey and it did work out well. He's now in first year of university doing um, measuring in chemistry. We're very proud of him. The inspiration to help people and, and to get into the natural way of, of, of healing yourself um, uh, got me into doing this.
Okay, so um, when I was younger, when I grew up, my plan was to always join the military. But uh, I mean, my grandfather got in a Bronze Star in Korea. Uh, my father enlisted for Vietnam. So I was in, I was about five days away from graduation and I got out of my rack one morning and when I put my foot down it felt like there was like a nail driving right up like a spike through my foot. When I got my medical discharge, um, they just basically sent me home. I didn't didn't have any insurance, you know what I mean? And I was in a lot of pain and I had to work. I was just coming home, I had to go back to work. So I had to figure out some way to deal with it. And the easiest thing were painkillers. For about, there was about three or four years for the Percocets. And then I was trying, I really, really, really wanted to roll for all of it, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to go through a withdrawal, you know what I mean? I was a coward. Kratom, um, I just, I use the powder, I make it tea, I just, uh, it's called, most people call it like pulse and wash, where you just dump the powder in and then swish it around. It tastes terrible, so my idea with that is to just get it out of the way as soon as possible. The negatives for me is, uh, when I started messing around with extracts, I did get the skin discoloration. And that was from the Kratom. It was like parts of like my cheeks and stuff would just get like a little bit brown. So it's not that Kratom is a cure-all, it's absolutely not a cure-all, but what it does is, if addiction feels like you're going down a hill on a bike with your hands in the air, Kratom will help you put your hands on the handlebars. And if you work enough, you'll be able to pump the brakes. And if you work more than that, you'll be able to steer the bike. Everybody in Philadelphia has some kind of identification with Rocky, but just that one line where, you know, like it's not about how hard you get hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep going. There's nothing more true. America's opioid crisis exploded in the late 1990s when Purdue Pharmaceuticals marketed OxyContin aggressively, especially in factory and mining areas where manual labor often leads to injury and pain. I went into the coal mines and um, got hurt. A rock fell on me, um, busted my knee all up, and that was during this, I don't know if you'd call it a pandemic or epidemic for sure, but people were getting opioids freely and I began to fall into that uh, atmosphere. Um, in the beginning it was for the pain um, and then I, f I found later that it I needed it. It's just something you you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. It's just terrible um, because they affected my life, they affected my family, they affected my job, they affected Everything that I wanted to do. Wade's sister suggested that he try Kratom-based products, and he did. About 15 to 20 minutes after I drank the, the Kratom, I began to feel better. And it just lifted my spirits. It, it helped my withdrawals. And I was able to quit the opioids with this Kratom tea. It, it, was, it was a lifesaver for me. So I suffer from degenerative disc disease in both my neck and back, and it is debilitating pain. I've been living with this for a very, very long time. Before Kratom, I was quite limited with my physical activity. I could not really bend and lift much. It was a issue going to the grocery store, like just little things that we all take for granted. At the time I discovered Kratom, I had just started taking care of my elderly mother who needed lots of attention. And because of this Kratom in my life, I was able to do the physical work I needed to, to take care of her. Looking back, I would have never been able to care for her the way I did if I was still taking opioids for my chronic pain. American Kratom product users who have switched from opioids to Kratom say the herbal product is safer and can be just as effective. While effects vary by individual and dose, Kratom users say it helps address pain. Unlike with opioids, tolerance isn't a problem, and cravings and withdrawal symptoms are much less strong than with opioids.
Kratom isn't just used as an alternative to opioids, though. For instance, some people use it for dealing with anxiety, depression, or PTSD. I struggled with anxiety and depression uh, for most of my life. Anxiety of, you know, not wanting to leave the house sometimes. Uh, struggled to get myself out of bed. Um, a huge fear of anything new. The depression would manifest itself in just having like episodes of two days, maybe three days, where I just didn't want to do nothing, didn't want to talk to anybody. I ended up getting medical treatment for my depression and anxiety, um, got some medications, just some basic antidepressants, and um, those helped a lot. And in conjunction with that, though, Kratom offers a good two to three hour relief of symptoms. For some, lesser doses of Kratom products provide a morning pick-me-up or an alternative to coffee for keeping sharp throughout the day. I make a about a 40-ounce French press of the Kratom every morning, and I let it steep. And then around 11 a.m. to about 2 p.m., I'll drink those, and it gives me a bit of energy, keeps me awake, and um, gets me through what would otherwise be nap time for me. Kratom users sing its praises. It seems to help in so many ways. Yet scientists and doctors say more research is needed to explore each of the claims. However, these are claims that uh, are out there and are endorsed by some of the Kratom consumers. So we have to take them uh, seriously for face value and uh, use them towards uh, employing more resources uh, to conduct more research. The chief advocate for Kratom in the United States is the American Kratom Association, which touts its benefits, advocates for regulations based on a model it authored, and runs a good practice certification program for manufacturers. Our organization is focused on two missions. One, preserve access for consumers, and secondly, preserve the marketplace by advocating for good regulations of Kratom products. So we want to make sure that to the extent that we are able to influence the decisions, that when a Kratom product enters the marketplace, that it's properly manufactured, that it is not adulterated, that it uses food-grade solvents for extract Kratom products, and that it's labeled properly. And that's what we advocate for both at the federal and the state level here in the United States. Kratom consumption is part of a much larger trend in the United States. Many people are turning to botanical remedies and dietary supplements to improve their health and well-being. I think there's a lot of self-medication. Well, number one, because I think human beings have always self-medicated. Um, but in, a, in America in particular, there's a problem with access to health care because it's so unaffordable. Uh, and, you know, people go to a doctor, they get a medicine, they feel better and and they're out a couple hundred dollars or depending if they don't have uh, health insurance they're out a couple of thousand dollars a lot of uh, Americans are using Kratom uh, because they're uh, seeking more natural alternatives to modern medicine there's uh, this movement and this big distrust towards uh, modern medicine and uh, also the big pharmaceutical industry the trend has its roots in folk medicine. And my great-grandfather had taken care of a lot of uh, the men in uh, logging camps. And, you know, he taught us that simple things like a yarrow plant was able to be applied to open bleeding wound to help uh, stop the bleeding. You know, and these are just things that was handed down by accident. You learned because you was around people who used them. Now, the attraction to botanicals is flourishing in all strata of society. I'm in this business because I believe there is an ancestrally aligned way of living that served us for hundreds of thousands of years, which we've deviated from in modern times and it has compromised our health as a whole. I like botanical remedies because often they are the zero 
consequence solution. They often treat the underlying causes of disease, inflammatory patterns, they're self-balancing most often, and they are going to be the most benefit with the least side effects. But medical scientists and botanists warn that just because the botanical remedy is natural, that doesn't mean it's good for you. Many plants are poisonous to humans. In, in modern times, very slowly, certain plants have been found to produce chemicals which can be adapted to make effective prescription medicines. So it's modifying the poisons in plants to make them useful to us and not toxic and lethal to us. For example, the yew tree, Taxus baccata. This is a plant which has produced poisons for millions of years to stop it being eaten or attacked by parasites or by fungi. And one of the chemicals it produces is, is a precursor of Taxol or Paclitaxol, a treatment for breast cancer. If you eat just that amount of a yew tree leaf, you will be dead. But, and a horse will be also killed by that amount. Uh, but the chemicals from this can be extracted and converted into Paclitaxol and in the right dose only kills the cells of dividing breast cancers. For many Kratom users in the United States, the herb doesn't seem to have much of a downside, mainly constipation, and if they take too much, nausea. But that doesn't mean Kratom-based products are always safe to consume or come without consequences. Haro says some sellers have been jacking up the quantity of a byproduct of metrogenine in their concoctions, creating potentially dangerous results. I was recently at a trade show where a lot of Kratom products were being displayed, and I see these vendors now developing novel new products, including vape pens with 7-hydroxymetrogenine that by nature are dangerous. Uh, they also have 7-hydroxy uh, extracted powders. Uh, those should be banned from the marketplace because they're not natural. Uh, they're synthetically derived, and that's a real threat to the, uh, to the public. In some cases, Kratom products have been blamed for deaths. Dustin Hernandez grew up in central Texas, a land of wide open spaces, cowboy culture, and endless ribbons of highway. Story sounds, I guess I'll tell it. Most folks around here say I should sell it. Dustin Hernandez's father died young, and the boy was raised by his mother and sisters. He went away to college, but afterwards he returned home and worked in the hospitality industry. He was working the night shift at the desk in a Motel 6 when he suffered a seizure and died. A coroner ruled that a metrogenine overdose caused his death. Um, Dustin was my boy. He was a good boy. He was shy. He was no troublemaker. He loved cats. He worked hard. He helped me a lot. And Kratom got him. Uh, Dustin started using Kratom about Four years before he passed away, he used it for anxiety. That's why he started using it. So when Dustin passed away, I was awake that night, 
at 3.30ish, and I smelled his cologne in the house, and I thought, how weird, and I thought, oh my gosh, something happened to him, and I thought, surely not. And then he was like coming home, and when the police knocked on the door, I knew something happened to him. Me and Dustin used to drink coffee, and he got me this cup. I miss drinking coffee with him in the mornings. I think at first it helped him a little bit, but the more he took it, the more he depended on it, and the more, really, the more anxiety he, he got. Uh, you know, he, he was a young man who had struggles with mental illness, with anxiety. He was looking for ways to, to get better, to feel better, and to find a real medication that would help him. And he told his family over and over again that um, according to what he had seen, this is something that is better than prescription medications for what he was dealing with, and it was safe and healthy. And for somebody like that, especially when they get dependent on the substance, it's, that's an that's a unjust road to have this young man walk to his death. MCT Law has won a couple of high-profile cases. In Florida, a judge awarded their clients $11 million. In a Washington State case, a jury awarded $2.5 million. Would you recommend Kratom to, you know, a, a father of a family who's a working man struggling with pain? Would you recommend Kratom as, you know, a potential uh, substance to provide relief? A few things that I would point out is if you want to take Kratom, do it under medical supervision, uh, inform your practitioner of it um, before you start taking it uh, because of the potential uh, for example, CNS additive effects, CNS depressant additive effects. This industry is a messy industry but I would characterize it as it's similar to organized crime. You have uh, entities and individuals at the top who are likely responsible for high percentages of the kratom that is getting smuggled into the country. And then you've got um, enough money, since this is a multi-billion dollar industry, you have enough money that they can totally take a page out of the playbook of um, big pharma and big tobacco and they hire lobbyists. They're even funding their own uh, Kratom-friendly uh, researchers. None of the defendants in these cases agreed to comment, but Haddow of the American Kratom Association in the Talavera case blamed the Kratom vendor and the Food and Drug Administration. And when you look at the product itself, it is stunning. It is a, essentially a Ziploc bag where they have written with a Sharpie on the front of it, space dust and they characterize it as, in their sales material, as an extract product, a, a highly potent extract. But they don't have any labeling on it. They don't give the you know, conditions for use, what's the serving size, don't describe what's in the product. That product should never have been on the marketplace. And to the extent that it either contributed to or caused the death of that individual, there's one responsible party, and that's the Food and Drug Administration, for their failure to stop that kind of marketing of products. In 2016, the Drug Enforcement Administration attempted to categorize Kratom as a Schedule I drug, like heroin and LSD, but it was turned back by an outcry from Kratom advocates. Earlier, the FDA banned the importation of Kratom. This approach essentially created a gray market where some unscrupulous vendors sell questionable products. The Food and Drug Administration says Kratom is not appropriate for use as a dietary supplement or food additive because there is inadequate information about potential health risks. It is considered an adulterated product. Under federal law, it is illegal to import or market Kratom for consumption by humans or animals. It is imported illegally, sometimes as potpourri, fertilizer, or incense. Salmonella has been found in shipments. Before introducing new dietary supplements, manufacturers or distributors must prove that the ingredients are safe for human consumption. To date, no sellers of Kratom-based products have done so. 
Federal regulations grandfather products that were sold as dietary supplements before 1994. Some distributors are seeking to establish that supplements containing Kratom were sold before then. If the Kratom industry wants to sell their product legally in the U.S., they first need to determine whether this product is a drug or a dietary supplement. It's currently marketed with pain relief and addiction mitigation claims that are drug claims. And as such, it would need to go through the FDA new drug approval process, which has to demonstrate both the safety of the product and the efficacy of it or its usefulness for the purported claim. If they wish to sell it as a dietary supplement, they have to find a use that is amenable to the supplement regulations for supporting some healthy function of the body, but they also still have to demonstrate safety. And here, the safety is a higher bar, actually, because a consumer would be using it on their own and unrestricted, you know, with, with there, there has to be a means to determine how a consumer can use this product safely. Do you use imported dietary supplements or non-prescription drugs? Do you use them because they're labeled in a language you know? Not all imported products sold as dietary supplements or as non-prescription drugs are safe. Some may not work, and others have been found to contain hidden chemicals that could hurt or even kill you. They may claim to be all-natural, alternative treatments, or herbal remedies. They promise things like weight loss, bodybuilding, sexual enhancement, and pain relief. Some even claim to treat cancer, HIV, or diabetes. But beware, claims like these don't necessarily mean the products work or are safe, and often they aren't. They are sold at ethnic stores, flea markets, gas stations, online, and in many other places throughout our communities. The best way to protect yourself and your family is to talk to your healthcare provider about safe and effective medical options. To learn more, visit www.fda.gov slash supplement safety. Uh, when the coroner called, he said, I'm pretty sure your son died of Kratom as he found a couple extract bottles in the trash can and he had seen other Kratom related deaths in the county. We'd never heard of Kratom, like others have said. We had to ask the coroner to spell it so that we could go Google it. A number of states have banned the sale and use of Kratom based products, and others have passed regulations requiring quality controls and labeling. Still, much of the Kratom is sold online, and it's a Wild West market. That's why the American Kratom Association is urging Congress to regulate the industry using model legislation that it drafted. This bill would require the FDA to establish a task force to examine health and safety issues. Also, it prohibits the FDA from regulating Kratom products more restrictively than it does food and dietary supplements. Kratom is a, a valuable harm reduction tool to many people trying to uh, get their lives back together, whether it's from addiction to opiates or alcohol, or just having a mood enhancement uh, thing that makes them feel better and more normal. For me, after a 14 year addiction to Oxycontin and being heavily ever overprescribed opiates by my doctors, I was able to find something that made me feel normal again. The AKA hosted lobbying activities in congressional buildings in late 2023, which included presentations by scientists and National Institute on Drug Abuse director Nora Volkov. Slide, just from the perspective of health and safety, again, very low evidence that the use of Kratom produces respiratory depression. But there are many things that we do not know that are important. We don't know how uh, Kratom uh, uh, products that are being sold with various contaminants influences health. We do not know much about that drug interaction, so you are in a medication and you are taking Kratom. It becomes important to see that these drugs don't counteract one another or enhance one another. We don't have data on the long-term effects of Kratom, and we also don't have data on the effects of the use of Kratom during pregnancy. Among the advocates were several people who told stories about arrests for possession of Kratom in states where it is banned. My father was addicted to heroin for 20 years. In 2019, he found Kratom, um, and he was able to be completely sober. Um, Kratom helped him with his withdrawals and suicidal thoughts. In 2021, he was arrested in Arkansas, where Kratom is banned. 
He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Three weeks into that sentence, he was killed. And so here I am a year later, I would like to see Arkansas lift their Kratom ban. Advocates fanned out to make their case for the legislation to staff members for their senators and representatives. So I just met with the aide in my rep's office here in the house and I had such a warm, receptive woman that like listened to my concerns, really seemed to care that I care about Kratom and really wanted to learn and understand more about this plan. So I feel really good about the meeting I just had. It went for you know several minutes. I, it wasn't like a quick get out of here. It was like, yeah, I want to hear this and I want to learn more. And she asked questions and it was very validating as a Kratom advocate. People who said they had lost loved ones to Kratom showed up outside the AKA gatherings and argued against the legislation. My opinion of the American Kratom Association's bill before Congress, the Federal Kratom Consumer Protection Act does nothing to protect consumers and is designed to advance their own interest at the expense of public health. The American Kratom Association downplays all Kratom deaths, yet at least three of the Kratom vendors listed on the AKA's website as GMP qualified are currently involved in wrongful death lawsuits. This bill is misleading in that they were, use the word consumer in the title and nowhere else in the rest of the bill. Even some of the Kratom advocates are calling for additional state and federal regulations to protect the health of consumers. As far as the laws with Kratom go, I think the more laws there are about labeling Kratom products, uh, the better, because then that's more information that gets out there to the consumer. I think the laws should be stronger where they are. There should be required testing, lab testing, to make sure there's no heavy metals and bacteria. I wish they all, all the laws, like in Oregon, allocated money for enforcement. If it was banned everywhere, then you'd, you'd go from a gray market, which a lot of people refer to it as gray market now, to a black market where there's no regulation. Like there's, we, we have half, maybe half the companies are doing the right thing. Uh, when Kratom's banned, zero companies will be doing the right thing. We're advocating for much stronger regulation. Uh, the existing regulations that are in place are not sufficient. Uh, we're advocating that dosage limits be set, uh, servings per container be set, that uh, the manufacturers have to follow good manufacturing processes and be certified so that uh, consumers are well informed and safe. One area of particular concern is the uh, ever increasing strength of extracts uh, and then also the new isolates. Extracts are fine uh, as long as they're produced correctly to have the same alkaloid profile as the uh, full leaf does. It's really, you know, it's the old saying that the poison is in the dose. While the number of deaths blamed on Kratom alone are still relatively few, they are still worrisome to some regulators, physicians, and legislators. Problem is, medical scientists' understanding of how Kratom interacts with the body is still rudimentary. It doesn't seem to depress breathing unlike heroin, but there is evidence that it could lead to seizures and heart attacks. It's very challenging to determine the cause of someone's death in this country. We kind of have this patchwork system of medical examiners and, and coroners and forensic pathologists, and they may or may not have adequate ability to obtain toxicologic testing. They may not have the financial resources to either do the investigation or to send the samples off to get the testing. They may not have the time and resources to do a complete investigation of the death. And so what you're seeing on the death certificate may or may not actually be the accurate cause of death. Most Kratom sellers asked to participate in this documentary either declined or didn't respond. Soren Shade of Top Tree Herbs agreed to speak because he said he had nothing to hide. 
My mission is to normalize Kratom tea. It is to help people understand the best means of consuming it, which I believe is following the traditional practices, which has been consumed for hundreds of years. We ensure the purity and consistency of our product by sourcing our Kratom through a GMP Kratom supplier and importer who does third-party independent lab testing on it, and which we then, upon purchasing bulk Kratom from them, enact our own independent third-party testing. Tragically, Soren's business partner, Sam Weber, died suddenly in bed one morning in 2022. A coroner blamed his death in part on metragenine toxicity. Soren says some medical experts are skeptical of the coroner's conclusion, yet still he struggles in the aftermath of Sam's death. I mean, so one of the questions is, as a business owner, you know, and a friend of someone who passed because of a perceived kratom overdose or metragenine-related toxicity, why and how do you keep on? How, how and why do you keep on keeping on? One of the ways that I try to honor his legacy is by continuing the business and trying to fulfill the vision, our shared vision, which is to introduce people to a plant that we personally believed in deeply and felt a great deal benefit from and, and recognize that millions of people also benefit from. Well, at least it's like the hill's on fire. <laughs> Get the spot. I need Westerners first learned of Kratom when Peter Wilhelm Korthals, a botanist who worked for the Dutch East India Company, described the plant in 1839. Latin name Mitragyna speciosa. It appeared to be nothing special, though, just one of 200 species that Korthals and his colleagues cataloged in studies of Indonesian flora, fauna, and culture. Ellen Field at the University of Edinburgh in 1921 identified mitrogenine as the dominant active alkaloid in dried leaves of the kratom tree. By then, the fresh leaf was reported to be used in Southeast Asia to help people deal with opium addiction and as an anesthetic. A decade later, scientists at Cambridge University used themselves as guinea pigs by consuming dried and powdered kratom leaves and recording their reactions. One of the volunteers promptly vomited and fainted. In 2002, a Japanese research group using guinea pigs concluded that several chemicals in dried kratom were full-on opioids, and two of them were more powerful than morphine. Yet a number of researchers are now raising questions about the conventional narrative. They point out that earlier studies identifying kratom as a full opioid were performed on animals, which can react differently than humans. They were done using dry powders rather than fresh leaves, and researchers focused on a handful of discrete compounds rather than evaluating the full spectrum of kratom alkaloids acting together. But what we know about uh, um, the most active, the most opioid active component of kratom, uh, which is known as uh, mitragynine or mitragynine, um, is uh, um, that it, it binds modestly to the receptor and it doesn't do very much when it binds. Some have had difficulty even finding any activity. These compounds, most of them in the plant, are interacting with opioid receptors. However, where we delineate this from a traditional opioid is that these compounds have activities at many receptor systems. It's interacting with adrenergic system, adrenaline or, or epinephrine that can give us that stimulant sort of feeling. Maybe mood elevation properties are coming from some of these serotonin uh, activities and we definitely see a difference with 
uh, Kratom products than we see with traditional opiates. Some scientists say there has been too much focus on a single component, mitrogenine, as it exists in dry Kratom and not enough attention on examining the full spectrum of active ingredients and the fresh leaf. Metragenin is a single compound, and that research, chemistry of, of, of metragenin is important and, and, and difficult and complex. But there needs to be a more careful evaluation of the whole leaf products, the whole leaf itself. My, my colleagues who did laboratory research started with mitragenine. We were trying to understand what was done in the laboratory and apply it to the knowledge of what people are consuming in the community, which I think is wrong. That's, this could be possibly the reason for some error in, in our understanding. And this is the conflation that, that needs to be corrected or addressed. This plant is a very complex natural product with many, many chemicals in it. And so I refer to this as a real complex symphony orchestra. And so we're taking each of those out like one instrument at a time, and we're listening to it at full blast. And so it doesn't give you the full picture of what that you know tiny piccolo is doing in the symphony orchestra. Um, but, but we finally get to those pieces and then understand how those all can come back together. So if we see um, doses get too high and maybe there's some, some adverse event that we see in an animal, we can start to understand where that may be coming from, from a, a single or multiple chemical wise in terms of the mechanism of action. Traditional medicines made of plants, animals, and microorganisms have been used since prehistoric times to treat diseases. Their use is based primarily on trial and error and handed down knowledge, rather than on scientific experiments. Example, ginseng for chronic diseases. Modern pharmaceutical medicines, sometimes derived from or modeled on natural substances, typically contain one or a few molecules designed to target specific pharmacological mechanisms. These drugs are developed using the scientific method and clinical trials to establish safety and efficacy. Example, Ozempic for diabetes. Now, some scientists are developing modern botanical medicines by employing scientific disciplines and processes to exploit natural substances and take advantage of their multi-dimensional chemistries. So far, only a few have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Example, mitesi for diarrhea. Some researchers are on the path to convert kratom into modern botanical medicines. They aim to identify the active ingredients in the fresh kratom leaf, understand how they interact with the human body and brain, grow plants with the optimal chemical profile, and produce products that are stable, safe, reliable, and effective. McCurdy and a sprawling research group at the University of Florida financed in part by a large grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, are taking a multidisciplinary look at Kratom. They're studying everything from botany to veterinary science. I think it's absolutely critical and foundational to our research to have our own trees to be able to get that farm to pharmacy approach. When we import a powder or import a product, we oftentimes, especially with Kratom, have no idea where it was produced how it was produced, how the handling occurred after its harvest. By having these trees here, it allows us to understand everything about these trees, how they're responding to their environment. And moving forward, it gives opportunities to my colleagues to have a known product to then move forward into either animal or human trials. So we largely started from scratch with how do these plants respond to varying levels of light, fertility, water, and how does that translate into the growth of the plant but also, just as importantly, the production of these secondary compounds or alkaloids that people are seeking out for medical benefit. After we harvest the leaf, we would um, dry the leaf and ground it into powder. So uh, normally we collect the leaf from the tree directly and then um, put it onto the trays, move it into the dehydrator and then wait for uh, until it's completely dry. After the leaves are completely dried, we take it out, ground it into powder, uh, put it in a sample vial, and then save it for further extraction and anal analysis. We do have an undergraduate researcher looking specifically at relationships between fungi and our kratom trees, 
mostly in the realm of germination of seed to increase the germination success. The positive effect would be that these fungi are actually living inside the roots of these plants and they are able to uptake either carbon from the soil or they're able to uptake different minerals, um, macronutrients and micronutrients. So they kind of provide a whole range of effects for their plant host. We like to think of them as the um, plant immune system, similar to how we have bacteria inside of us. They're doing similar effects. Our most significant findings probably have to circle and focus around the diversity that we see within these trees. From tree to tree, we can have drastically different alkaloids, even when they're being produced in a similar controlled environment. I think we're at the tip of the iceberg of trying to understand the diversity that is actually truly there in nature and to draw from that. Another lesson the horticulture group has learned is that it's difficult to grow kratom trees in the United States. They don't like freezing temperatures and some trees grown here don't produce much metrogeny. Meanwhile, on the Gainesville campus of the University of Florida, botanists and biochemists are studying how kratom trees produce the active ingredients in their leaves. What I'm excited about is uh, to find out how each of these unique alkaloid is being made in the plant. We should be able to manipulate the plant, for example, to, to have a mitrogynous speciosa. You tell me what kind of composition you want, for example. You want high mitrogynine, high speciogynine. We should be able to manipulate the plant in such a way that we could make the optimal uh, you know, composition that probably the pharmacy group may need to study further. So this is where we do our chemical reactions or extractions and start to process the leaf material and pull those chemicals out of the leaf. And then once we concentrate that um, and get rid of the organic solvents, we'll subject that to some medium pressure chromatography uh, where we can start to isolate these. And then you can actually see the products that come out of that separation are separated into tubes and then we can check each and every one of these tubes to see exactly what chemicals are in those tubes. Now, this is the purified form of mitragynine. It started from the crude kratom alkaloid, uh, kratom powder, and we did a, a solid state col uh, column chromatography to get this uh, mitragynine as a pure product. I do pharmacokinetics. You want to know how is it getting absorbed, metabolized, or excreted. That's my job to know. So this is a UPLC MSMS system. This is liquid chromatography, mass spectroscopy, where we put our samples. And then these compounds reaches into this mass spec. This mass spec ionizes those compounds and then breaks into in their daughter ions and based on compounds molecular weight and very selective daughter ion, we quantify those. So this is a cute of mass spec, which has pretty good mass accuracy. So this instrument is used to identify unknowns. It could be metabolites, like if I took crotum material for any alkaloid, right? Now my, my liver or my intestinal enzymes will metabolize it, break into the different parts. What are those parts? It is also important if activity is coming from that compound or coming from those metabolites. My job is to understand the pharmacology, how it's working at the various receptors in the brain, and then demonstrate what that does behaviorally on a broader level, evaluating things like, is it addictive? Will it cause respiratory depression? Can it prevent those factors from traditional opioids? Can it prevent withdrawal? So far, all of the pharmacological testing there has been done on animals, not humans. Some of the most interesting work is being done in the Department of Veterinary Science, where they are testing the effectiveness of kratom in treating arthritis pain. All of the dogs in our study are enrolled because they have a naturally occurring arthritis as their condition. And osteoarthritis is a condition that affects both dogs and people. And so dogs serve as a perfect model for evaluating Kratom's efficacy for the treatment of chronic pain. So our primary intervention or outcome measure in this study was looking at gait analysis. So the amount of force placed on a pressure mat and seeing if that improves from baseline with the intervention, the Kratom supplement, as opposed to the placebo. Oh. Oh, no. 
that's a good girl. That's a good girl. Although we are starting with evaluating chronic pain, uh, I think we also want to look at acute pain or surgical pain. And so understanding how kratom may play a role in these different types of painful conditions will also give us the information that we need for treatment of these types of conditions in people. The next major challenge for scientists is getting ready for clinical trials in the United States. That work includes improving their understanding of how ingredients in kratom act on the brain, running more tests on animals to demonstrate safety and effectiveness, and securing consistent supplies of key ingredients to be tested on humans. Large pharmaceutical companies have shown little interest in kratom. Observers say that's because botanical medicines are difficult and expensive to develop, and because firms can't patent organic chemicals. Yet some smaller biotech firms are developing metrogenine-based medicines. One of them, Cures Incorporated, is developing a drug for pain. Cures scientists removed a hydrogen molecule from metrogenine and replaced it with deuterium, which they claim makes the therapy more stable and safer for humans. They ran a clinical trial in New Zealand that showed positive results for safety. If approved, you'll have an FDA-driven, uh, very rigorous uh, process to develop a drug, and, it, and therefore you have a better handle on supply chain. You know, for instance, you, you may want to go to a vape shop or pick up some kratom someplace and you, you don't know where it came from. You don't know uh, how it was made, how, how long it sat in, a, in, a, in, a, in transit from Malaysia to, to you know, some terminal somewhere in a port um, here in the U.S. So there's, there's better, tighter regulations and control around uh, uh, the supply chain and provenance of, of the product. The National Institute on Drug Abuse is researching Kratom with the goal of developing candidates for treating substance use disorder. And so we're interested in isolating uh, uh, compounds from Kratom which uh, may have value for the treatment of uh, uh, substance use disorders, particularly opioid use disorders where we've been working since 2019 to generate and formulate and check the stability and go through all the, NI, the uh, uh, FDA requirements to generate uh, a mitragynine product that uh, um, we will be able to make available for clinical studies. I, I would say that uh, we will be able to enter clinical testing of this within, uh, within a year to 18 months. Clinical trials on humans can show if a proposed medicine is safe and effective. There are four key elements in the design of a clinical trial. They are placebo controlled. One group of participants gets the target therapy. The other gets a placebo, which typically has no therapeutic value. They are randomized. Participants are assigned randomly to a subgroup, which determines whether they get the therapy or a placebo. This technique reduces potential selection biases. They are double blind. Neither the participant nor the researcher knows if they're getting the target treatment or the placebo. They are double dummy. Both groups receive substances or interventions that look and in some cases taste the same. If you read a scholarly article about a medical experiment involving Kratom and it doesn't list all these attributes, be skeptical of the results. In the run-up to clinical trials, there's a lot to be done and learned. One area of particular interest for researchers is 7-hydroxymetrogenine, 7-OH for short. It's not present in freshly picked kratom leaves. Rather, it's produced as leaf material dries and also in the digestive systems of test animals. 7-OH interacts strongly with some of the opioid receptors in the brain, and it may provide much of Kratom's pain-killing punch. 7-hydroxymetrazine is many times more potent. It's hypothesized to be many times more potent and dangerous than, than metrazine itself. Researchers in Malaysia believe it may also be responsible for some of the adverse reactions that Americans have reported. Based on our study, which we recently conducted on the freshly collected kratom leaf, 7 hydroxymetrogenine is an oxidative compound 
oxidative chemicals produced from nitrogenin and this leads to the effects of exposure of nitrogenin in kratom leaf during shipping. Longer shipping periods might produce, might convert the, the mitragenin inside the leaf into 7 hydroxy mitragenin. We could hypothesize that the toxic effect that been reported on kratom, it might do it to the presence of 7 hydroxy mitragenin. We are hypothesizing that at least some of these resulting products are highly toxic. In early 2024, scientists and Kratom sellers gathered for an International Kratom Science Symposium at the Orlando campus of the University of Florida. So the main thing we're trying to accomplish by bringing people from all over the world researching Kratom together is to bring this community together to share uh, all of our research with each other in a non-competitive way uh, where we can all learn and benefit from each other to expand uh, really the knowledge across the globe on this plant. More than 20 scientists made presentations and discussed some of their latest findings. Those partial agonists that are inside Kratom, those alkaloids, are also really key towards treating, we think, opioid withdrawal because we've already demonstrated through our recent findings that those partial agonists don't produce the same magnitude of physical dependence that the full agonists do, and they don't produce the same addictive effects that some of the full agonists can do, but at the same time, they allow us to hopefully wean off the opioids safely. And we've just demonstrated that in a recent study we presented here. In my latest research, one of the things I found that's extremely interesting is that Kratom use disorder or substance use disorder based on Kratom is looking a lot more like physical dependence. So that's tolerance and withdrawal symptoms, but not addiction. So to date, people are not going out and robbing banks to go get Kratom and use it. We had done a um, probably the largest uh, study of its kind to um, really understand uh, some of the pharmacology of, of uh, metragenine, which is the main alkaloid in, in Kratom. Um, from a safety standpoint, I mean, the compound appeared to be pretty safe, I mean, overall. I mean, even at high doses, you may see some changes that were probably not significant, certainly weren't significant enough to, to stop the study over, um, in terms of some of the liver enzymes, there were really nothing at all in the way of cardiovascular effects that we could say. Our recent surveys have shown that there is a particular correlation between kratom use and several psychological disorders like uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, um, post-traumatic stress disorders, depression and anxiety. We noticed that those who met inclusion criteria of one of these psychiatric conditions actually tended to do quite well with moderate doses of kratom use. Now, in the past, we get to see people who are dependent on heroin. You know, Kratom was very commonly used among people uh, who were dependent on heroin. Now, in the last couple of years, we get to see uh, through my field studies, through my research, we get to see more and more people who are dependent on methamphetamine alone, as well as methamphetamine and heroin, using Kratom to self-treat their methamphetamine addiction. Chad Rysick, a supervisory pharmacologist at the FDA, presented preliminary results of a pilot safety study that raised no red flags concerning short-term effects of kratom on humans. Going forward, scientists see three possible pathways for kratom-based products as regulated health supplements, as botanical drugs, and as conventional pharmaceuticals. Any FDA approvals for medicines are likely to be years off, though. In the meantime, scientists caution individuals using kratom-based products to be careful out there. When somebody wants to take kratom before they start taking kratom, I would advise them to start with just a whole leaf or crushed leaf powder and start with a very low dose to make sure that the kratom product that they want to consume is adequately labeled, meaning there is a dose recommendation on the label. There, it's clearly stated that it's not intended to treat, cure, prevent, or diagnose a condition. 
In addition, I would advise anybody who wants to take Kratom to actually consult with their healthcare provider. Make sure that there are no drug interactions that put them at risk of potentially adverse effects um, that might harm them in the long run.